This favored users are sources of a lot of good scenarios too. Think of somebody who wants to hack into your web system, for example. That's a disfavored user. How does your system protect you from them? Many businesses still use paper forms. Employees or customers fill out the forms, but as the computer systems of that company evolve, they start letting people enter data directly into the forms online or into replacement forms. As the company goes through this evolution, every one of the old forms becomes the source for all sorts of possible scenarios. I mentioned the life histories of objects in lecture one. Now let's consider system events. A list of system events would include all the types of things that happen that the system has to respond to. In contrast, a list of special events includes things that don't happen very often, but that might cause your system to work differently when they do happen. System events and special events sound pretty similar. It confuses my students. So here's an example. When you're home and you get a phone call or the pizza delivery man comes by, those are system events. But on your birthday, that's a special event. Now here's why it's important to think about special events. On your birthday when the phone rings, you might answer the phone differently. The special event might cause you to respond to system events in a different way. The same system provides different benefits to different people. Anybody can use any of the features, but different people have different needs. So for example, in the get a job system, Jane the 20 year old uses all the coaching on how to write a resume. Sarah, the real estate agent, she knows how to do that. What she values is all the contact management software. You can learn a lot about your program by studying its competitors. Anything that attracts your interest in their program becomes a scenario test in yours. You can also base scenarios on complaints about competing programs or earlier versions of your program. For some of these bugs, you can write simple tests like function tests. Don't waste your time writing stories on these. But if you need to understand or explain the human motivations, or if there's a lot of complexity in the test, use a scenario. A friend of mine tested a database management system. That's a program like FileMaker or Microsoft Access. He tested it by creating a jewelry company that kept all of its inventory and all of its sales records in the database system. Now this wasn't a real company, but it was a good simulation because it fit the profile for the intended customers for the database manager, small businesses. Over months of testing, he'd read the newspaper and he'd get ideas from its stories and its ads. So he had pre-Christmas sales, he got robbed, his biggest diamond supplier went out of business, FedEx lost some of his shipments, he bought a store that belonged to one of his competitors, he opened a third store but it didn't do well so he closed it later. One of his stores burned down. He had an ultimate stress test one year, his company bought Macy's right after Christmas. Well all these events had their effect on the database. In fact, they had such big effects that he had to keep reorganizing the database. And he had a big shoplifting problem. So periodically, he'd have to audit what was actually in the stores and then re-enter lots of data. This was really tedious. And so he was constantly revising his data entry forms and his queries. He found a lot of cool bugs this way. And he can explain how each bug interfered with the normal business use of the product. As a result, his bugs were understood their significance was understood, and most of them got fixed. When you upgrade a program that manages lots of data, it's tempting to feed the new version lots of real life data from previous versions. You can often get that from customers of the old versions. But here's the problem. How do you know whether the new version's calculations and reports are correct? How much work is it gonna take you to evaluate the results? If you don't have an efficient, easy to use evaluation strategy, you're only going to recognize the most obvious failures. You're going to miss bugs that calculate the wrong answer, but format its printout correctly. That's been a very common testing problem. One last example. Imagine a competitor for the Get a Job program. What reports does your competitor print? For example, suppose that before you go to a job interview, the competing program can print an interview preparation file. The file organizes everything you've sent to the company and everything you've learned about the company. Now that you've seen the competitor do this, how close can get a job get to doing it? How much work will it take? What kinds of mistakes does it make when you try? What these approaches have in common is that they lead you to create suites, collections of several related tests. I often give students an exercise. Create 10 scenarios for a program using one of these approaches. Pick your approach. Some students try to use all these approaches together. 
They try to create tests that look at user types and object types and competing products and so on. Pack them all into one test. Don't do that. Pick one approach and work with that one for a while. Each of these approaches can generate hundreds of really interesting tests. Develop your skills with them individually. Combine them later when you have more experience. When you create a suite of scenario tests, each test has to present a scenario. Here are some suggestions on how to do that. First, every scenario has to be a coherent story. It has to run from a start to a finish in a way that makes sense. One of the very common mistakes that inexperienced testers make is to string together an arbitrary sequence of actions and call it a scenario. This doesn't work, not unless the sequence hangs together. If someone reads your scenario and says, but why would anyone do that? You have to be able to answer that in a credible way speaking to the motivation of the people involved. Otherwise, the scenario fails. The story also has to be credible. This means that the people who read the story should believe that the program is going to run into a situation like this. Maybe not very often, but it will happen. You might have to include details in your description of the story that address the credibility. A story is motivating if someone important thinks the program should pass this test. So when you craft your story, you have to think about what details have to be included to make it motivating. As part of making the story motivating, Sometimes you target a specific stakeholder. Think back to the postage stamp bug. The PageMaker tests were all focused on the marketing manager. He was the guy who wanted to make public comparisons between PageMaker and our product. So he was the guy whose reputation was in trouble if the PageMaker test didn't work. There are lots of ways to build meaningful complexity into a story. As you tell a story about how the program gets used, you naturally reach lots of features and lots of data values. Note the emphasis on meaningful complexity. A bunch of unrelated features or actions create a weak story, not a usefully complex one. Early in testing, you're better off testing your features one at a time. Get them reasonably stable before you try combinations of several features, otherwise you're going to be plagued with blocking bugs. As the program gets more stable, you can create more complex tests. But for scenarios, the complexity must be believable. There are other ways to do combination testing with arbitrary combinations. We'll study these in Lecture 6. Finally, scenario tests should be easy to evaluate. Now, this is valuable for all tests, but it's especially important for scenarios because they're complex. The problem is that with complex results, if the answer isn't obvious, if you have to do work to figure out whether the program passed or failed, and if you have a bunch of tests to evaluate, you're likely to look at the results and say, well, it looks plausible to me, and not actually check out all the details. In the art of software testing, Glenn Meyer summarized IBM data that showed that over 30% of the bugs that people discovered in the field had actually been exposed by tests that testers had run. They should have been found in the lab. The problem was that it took so much time to evaluate the results that the testers didn't go through those evaluations for those cases, and they missed the bugs. When you design complex tests, it's important to design them in a way that makes failures obvious. It's easy to spend too much time writing your scenarios. You have to develop a good story in your head, but you don't have to write it all down. You only need enough detail to remind you of what you should do when you test. You only tell the full story when you write the bug report. There's nothing wrong with improvising many of the details of your test. You just have to be able to recreate something equivalent to what you did if you find a bug. Scenario testers challenge the product's designs. To do this well, testers often do the same things that requirements analysts do. They study how people use the product, they study the product risks and the design alternatives, but instead of trying to create designs that everybody agrees to, the testers try to create critical examples. They want to bring out the weaknesses. They want to get people talking about what to do about them. Sometimes these examples revisit design compromises that were made a long time ago. But back then, people agreed to a compromise that was theoretical. Now that they see how the program actually works, the result might be intolerable. It doesn't matter if they agree to it. They won't put up with it. Testers do this because it's better to have a big controversy while the product's in testing than a mess when the product goes into service in the field.